The quick collapse of France during World War II was a shock to many in the world. Its colonial empire was largely administered from a German puppet government known as Vichy France, and there was a major worry from the Allied High Command of antagonizing the puppet French government enough that they'd openly fight against the Allied forces. However, this didn't limit Allied actions against the state, and in today's video, we will be looking at one such conflict, the British invasion of French Syria. In May 1941, French Admiral Francais Darlon, deputy of the Vichy French state, signed the Paris Protocols with the Germans. The Protocols granted Germany access to military facilities in Vichy-controlled Syria. The Protocols remained unratified, but Henri Dentz, the High Commissioner for the Levant, was instructed to allow German and Italian aircraft the ability to refuel in Syria. They would be marked as Iraqi aircraft, and Axis aircraft were landed in Syria, en route to the Kingdom of Iraq during the Anglo-Iraq War, which I have a video already uploaded on the channel about. The Germans also requested permission from the Vichy authorities to use Syrian railways to send armaments to the Iraqis in Mosul. The months prior to the Lebanon-Syrian campaign saw the Middle Eastern command under General Archibald Wavell stretched to the limit. He was faced with an ongoing campaign in North Africa, and with his force significantly depleted following the disasters in Greece and Crete, Wavell learned of Churchill's desire to invade Syria and Lebanon, something that Wavell personally opposed. There were several reasons for Churchill's desired invasion, chief among them being the possibility for Lebanon and Syria to be used as a base for the Germans, should they be allowed to enter the area by a sympathetic Vichy France. This would threaten vital Allied oil supplies in Iraq and Iran, as well as Haffa in Palestine. This fear was exacerbated by the coup of the pro-Axis Rashid Ali in Iraq on April the 3rd of 1941, which again threatened oil supplies through the Middle East. Had the Germans effectively supported the revolt, it may have posed an even greater threat to security in the unstable region. Should the Germans secure a strong foothold in the region, the political and diplomatic repercussions, both there and in Egypt and Turkey, posed a potential threat to the Allied war effort. And while Wavell knew that his force was stretched extremely thin with the fight in North Africa, he had no choice but to agree to Churchill's demand, so he appointed General Henry Mitland Wilson to oversee the operation. In terms of troop numbers, in Syria, Lebanon, French Army General Henry Dentz had around 85,000 regular troops at his disposal, under the Army of the Levant. This army was still divided into troops from metropolitan France, colonial troops, and the so-called Special Troops of the Levant. The colonial troops were formed by 11 battalions of infantry, 3 Lebanese Light Infantry Battalions, and 8 Syrian Battalions. In addition, there were two artillery groups and miscellaneous supporting units. The so-called Special Forces included around 5,000 cavalry, organized in squadrons of around 100 men each. Included in the cavalry force were 15 squadrons of Circassian cavalry, of which three were motorized. These special units were led by indigenous and non-commissioned officers. In combination to this, the French also had an armored slash mechanized contingent, which totaled 90 tanks, which were mostly Renault R35s with a few Renault FTs, and a similar number of armored cars. On the naval side, the French could muster only two destroyers and three submarines. The British, on the other hand, were able to muster around 34,000 men, 18,000 of them being from Australia, and another 8,000 British regulars, which was supplemented with some Czech battalions that were in the region. This also included around a 5,000-man free French units that were also assigned to the task. 
they could field around 100 aircraft with a naval contingent which contributed the landing ship of the HMS Gladiator, five cruisers, and eight destroyers for the operation. The invasion of Syria was to be split into four invasion forces, a thrust on Damascus and Beirut from Palestine, a thrust on northern Syria and Palmyra from Iraq, and a final thrust on Tripoli, also from Iraq. With the two thrusts from Palestine, they were the first group to engage Vichy forces, with the Iraqi troops invading two weeks later. They had ten set-piece battles taking place during this month's long campaign, and the Australians bore the brunt of the fighting for the region, and as you can expect, tensions between the head of the Australian Corps, which was a man by the name of John Laverick, and his British superiors soon happened. General Wavell and other individuals didn't seem to understand the terrain, and they underestimated the enemy to a heavy degree, both in terms of troop numbers and quality. This lack of understanding of the enemy and the terrain was compounded by Metland's decision to base himself in the luxurious King David Hotel in Jerusalem, about 200 kilometers away from the main fighting. From here, he attempted to run the entire campaign prior to Lavrik's promotion on June the 18th of 1941. Wavell, meanwhile, was primarily concerned with operations in North Africa, and from the beginning, he stated his opposition to the campaign on the grounds that he did not have the available resources. With him torn between numerous fronts, Wavell focused his attentions on the ongoing Operation Battle Axe, which was launched one week after the beginning of the Lebanon-Syrian campaign, which, unsuccessfully, sought to wrest control of Saranaika from the Axis and raise the siege of Tobruk. Wavell's focus on North Africa meant that the Lebanon-Syrian campaign was not provided with any real tank support, something that would have made the advance somewhat smoother. The British High Command thought that the Vichy forces would simply surrender at the site of Australian units, and during the first few days of fighting, they didn't even give the men helmets, and the maps that were provided to them were on such a scale that they were utterly useless. The first set battle was at Ladenau River on June the 9th, one day after the start of the invasion. Australian forces came under fire from well-defended Vichy forces on the flip side of the river. British commandos managed to cross the river after being landed, and they took the defenses, but suffered heavy casualties in the process. A Vichy counterattack by armoured cars was driven off, and the Australians were able to establish a pontoon bridge to continue on their advance, and they were able to win a handful of set-piece battles along the way. The next major action would occur at the Battle of Kosowe on June the 15th, the last main stronghold before Damascus. The hills surrounding the terrain made even travel by foot difficult if they were not on the road, and the city's layout allowed the French ample pre-built defense capabilities. Heavy fighting would occur at Kosowe, but the Fiji defenses were largely too strong, and over 300 British soldiers had to surrender after a day of fighting. It was decided that the city would be bypassed, and they'd march onto Damascus itself. Damascus was heavily fortified by a ring of forts and in-depth trenches. British and Indian troops managed to capture and hold onto a handful of the forts on the night of the 19th. Counterattacks failed to break the British and Indian positions, with both sides suffering heavy losses. The initial advantage that the French Air Force enjoyed did not last long. The Vichy French lost most of the aircraft, as it was destroyed on the ground where the flat terrain, the absence of infrastructure, and the absence of modern anti-aircraft artillery made them very vulnerable to British attacks. By June the 21st, the French garrison in Damascus was running out of food and ammunition, thus they surrendered to the British forces, yet the campaign was not yet over. From here, there were three main actions that occurred at French garrison cities, ones that housed the majority of the still remaining Vichy French troops that were left in Syria. 
On July the 1st, fighting occurred at the city of Palmer, which was fortified by 300 Vichy French forces, which had been a rallying point for the remaining French forces in the area. An Australian detachment managed to capture the city, and they took most of the garrison captive, scattering the regrouping French. After the Battle of Des Moines on July the 8th, the fate of the French in Syria was sealed. Henri Dent sought an armistice, which was into effect the following day, and around 30,000 miscellaneous Frenchmen surrendered by the 12th. Most of them decided to be expedited to mainland France, rather than join the Free French Forces, which was a major blow to the recruitment effort, as was being hoped from this operation. Around 2,500 Frenchmen and around 5,000 British slash Commonwealth troops had been casualties during this month-long campaign, making it much more costly than what was originally anticipated. Operations against the Vichy regime in Syria could only be conducted with troops withdrawn from the western desert, a dispersal that contributed to the defeat in Operation Battleaxe, and made the Syrian campaign take longer than necessary. Churchill had decided to sack Wavell in early May over his reluctance to divert forces to the Iraqi War, and Wavell was relieved on June the 22nd, relinquishing command on July the 5th. In late July of 1941, French General de Gaulle flew into the Syrian territory to congratulate the victors, and he placed French General Georgi Gatto in control of Syria and Lebanon. On November the 26th, shortly after taking up the post, he recognized the independence of Syria and Lebanon in the name of the Free French Movement. After elections in the territories on November the 8th of 1943, Lebanon became an independent state, and on February the 27th of 1945, they would both declare war on Germany and Japan. Yet, by the end of the war, the French would renege on this independence recognition, setting the stage for the first major incident post-World War II, and this incident would threaten to destroy the alliance that six years of bloodshed had built up, but that is a topic for another time. I hope you enjoyed the brief look into one of the more forgotten campaigns of the Second World War. If there's a topic that you'd like me to cover in the future, say so down in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you all next time.